Spirit move this morning. Um, so what book are we at now? Jemima. Jemima? Yeah, Jemima Pancakes. We're in Jer J J J J J J J J we're in Jeremiah. It's going to be Jeremiah 8, 18 through 9, uh, through 9 2. Uh, one of the things I would ask you to do this morning is to uh, keep your Bibles open, read it with me, and keep your Bibles open as we go through it. Um, Jeremiah 8, 18 through 9, 2. Uh, just a short little section. Let me read it. This is the prophet Jeremiah. Oh, my comforter in sorrow, my heart is faint within me. Listen to the cry of my people from a, far, a land far away. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is her king no longer there? Why have they provoked me to anger with their images, with their worthless foreign idols? The harvest is past, the summer has ended, and we are not saved. <clears throat> Since my people are crushed, I am crushed. I mourn, and horror grips me. There you go. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there no healing for the wound of my people? Oh, that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears. I would weep day and night for the slain of my people. Oh, that I had, a, had in the desert a lodging place for travelers, so that I might leave my people and go away from them. For they are all adulterers, a crowd of unfaithful people. As I said last week, um, Jeremiah is the longest book in the Bible. Not in chapter numbers, but in sheer number of words. I said this also, and that is that God has a, a couple of ways that he emphasizes things. One way is that he repeats it. So, you know, <clears throat> God doesn't have a highlighter, and he can't underline something, he can't put it in italics, so he repeats it. There's a second way that God emphasizes things in Scripture, and that is just by the sheer volume of the length of which he talks about something. And so you can understand it that way. Uh, here's an example. In Matthew 23, God, or Christ, excoriates and jumps the Pharisees' rear end uh, in no uncertain terms. It's a fairly long chapter, so it has lots of uh, volume to it, if you want to put it that way. Um, and it repeats the word woe seven times. Because of that, what we know is, is that the most judged individual, sinner, in all time in history, is not all the other laundry list of criminals that we might think about, it's the false prophets. Because that's what Christ condemns uh, in Matthew 23 with the seven woes. He takes the Pharisees very much to task for their false doctrine and for their false religion. Understand something. Jeremiah and a lot of the Old Testament, but particularly the Old Prophets, Isaiah and Malachi is 17 prophets, Jeremiah being one of them, um, uh, go largely un, uh, untouched and unpreached and untaught, um, which is a tragedy. I would say this morning, right now in America, this morning, right now it's a Sunday morning, how many sermons are being preached out of the Old Testament? How many are being preached out of the 17 prophets? Hmm. I would say two. I'm going to go with two. I like that. I'm going to say two, mine and maybe one other. It, 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 it's just ignored. You cannot understand or know the New Testament until you understand and know the Old. That's the way it works. There's, it, to, there's no proper way to do, as they call it, exegesis of New Testament Scripture until you have thoroughly understood the Old Testament. Because that it, the, the root system for the, Old, uh, the New Testament is in the Old. Okay. <clears throat> the book of Jeremiah, hear me when I say this, should be just like John 3.16. How many know John 3.16? In quote, Our knowledge and understanding of the book of Jeremiah should be the same. We should at least know the overall theme of the book of Jeremiah. Why? Because it's the longest book in the Bible. That means that that's where God put his podium pounding. It's the longest book. It needs to be emphasis there. But there is not. I want to examine the, the context of Jeremiah, and then we're going to talk about some things. 
The name of our sermon is The Harvest is Passing. Jeremiah was a priest, so he served at the temple. Jeremiah, and hear me when I say this, I know there's a lot of numbers here, but I want you to pay attention to these numbers because there's going to be a test on it after service. Okay. Because it's important to under, understand the context. Very important to understand the context. Jeremiah started his prophetic ministry in 626 B.C. That's before Christ. So 626 years before Christ, Jeremiah started his prophetic ministry. He ministered for about 46 years, which, which takes you up to about 580 B.C. because the numbers work backwards. How many knew that? B.C., you know, every year that you go, it goes backwards. So the next year after 626 is what? 625, and so on and so forth, it goes in reverse. <clears throat> at the beginning, hear me when I say this, at the beginning of Jeremiah's ministry, Judah was being ruled by its most godly king, Josiah. King Josiah was the most godly king to rule either Judah or Israel flat out. And when I say that he was Judah's and Israel's most righteous king, there's no way that I can overstate that. Josiah was passionate for God and for revival in Judah like no other. If you want to get to know Josiah, read 2 Kings 23. Believe it or not, Josiah was even more godlier than King David. How many knew that? Josiah, by far and large, hands down, swept the, the awards for being the most godly and the most passionate king for God ever. <clears throat> So at the front end of Jeremiah's ministry, his prophetic ministry, for the first 18 years of his prophetic ministry, he had a godly king who was just as passionate and just as, as, as godly as Jeremiah was. The problem was is that Jer Josiah's reforms did not convert themselves into revival. And that was because the people of Judah arrogantly thought that they couldn't and wouldn't be touched by any judgment. Now Josiah came to the throne in 640 B.C., which is 14 years before Jeremiah started his ministry. Okay? And then in 608 B.C., Josiah was killed in battle. He was killed by Pharaoh Necho. How many here would name your kid Necho? Never mind. Uh, Pharaoh Necho killed him in battle, and Egypt took over Judah, conquered it. In that moment... Judah slid into the ditch of judgment. Some of Josiah's sons were placed on the throne, but they were absolutely worthless. Judah was conquered by the Egyptians in 608, and then, three years later, because the Babylonians were on their war path, the Babylonians came in from Babylon, which is about 1,500 miles away, and swept through Judah, conquered it, and took it over in 605 B.C., three years later. So, in a very short period of time, the nation of Judah faced some judgment. <clears throat> but, having been conquered by, initially by Egypt, and under Egypt's rule for three years, and then conquered by Babylon, one of the sons of Josiah that was on the throne rebelled against Babylon. Uh, a couple of years later. And so the result of that was that the Babylonian army came back and defeated Judah and Jerusalem again in 597 B.C., seven years later. And guess what? Another one of Josiah's sons, King Zedekiah, after 597, he rebelled against Babylon again. And 11 years later, in 586 B.C., the Babylonians, after a two and a half year siege of Jerusalem, conquered Judah, conquered Jerusalem, conquered everything. They destroyed, and when I say destroy, I mean destroy. They destroyed the city of Jerusalem, they destroyed the temple, and they exiled all but a handful of the people out of the land. The Babylonians captured King Zedekiah. They killed his sons right in front of him. Then immediately they gouged out his eyes. And then they took him to Babylon and threw him into prison where he stayed until he died. 
And that was the wrath that Jeremiah saw coming, that he prophesied over and over and over again yeah. in the longest book in the Bible. Jeremiah faithfully prophesied the coming just destruction of Judah and Jerusalem for 18 years under King Josiah. And then he continued to prophesy the next thing, the same things for the next 28 years after that. Under Josiah, Jeremiah was celebrated and protected by the king. The king loved him, and Jeremiah loved the king. After Josiah died, Jeremiah's life became a living hell of a sort. Uh, and the reason why, hear me when I say this. And they're listed out in the book of Jeremiah. There were literally only a handful of people in Judah that were godly. You can count five of them. Five godly people. You might be able to add to that number a little bit if you want to get generous. <clears throat> now God has always had a remnant. How many know that? Have you ever heard that before? That God always has a remnant. No matter how wicked a society might get, no matter how wicked Israel might have gotten or Judah might have gotten, God always had a remnant. Remember that? Amen. Well, this remnant virtually disappeared. And in our Christian time, this is true as well. In the last 2,000 years, no matter how the ebb and flow of spirituality was amongst the Christian, amongst the Christian nations, uh, God always has had a remnant. <clears throat> During the time of Elijah, which was 200 years prior to our time of Jeremiah, uh, God declared to Elijah something. He says this in 1 Kings 19, 18. He says, Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. In other words, God had reserved for himself 7,000 in Israel that were godly. And this was under the kingship of King Ahab, Israel's second most wicked king. But at the time of Jeremiah, Jeremiah was pretty much alone. What is unprecedented about this is that Jeremiah stayed true to his message despite virtually everyone being against him. And this included his priestly family. Jeremiah didn't get married because God told him not to. So he didn't have immediate family. But his extended family, his brothers, his sisters, his mother, his father, they all opposed him. And not only did they oppose him, but they wanted him killed. Think about that. Our text this morning represents a conversation. That conversation primarily happens within verse 19. Uh, the first part of verse 19 is Jeremiah speaking. The middle part is the exiles that have been exiled to Babylon are speaking. And then the last part of verse 19 is God speaking. Uh, one of the things we need to understand here is that Jer this has not yet happened. This is a prophecy. Jeremiah is using a very powerful technique by painting a scenario in a conversation about something that hasn't happened yet. It's still in the future. And that conversation starts out in verse 18 um, with Jeremiah expressing great grief. He says, you who are my comforter and sorrow, my heart is faint within me. He sees what is coming and is so overwhelmed that he is not able to be comforted. Jeremiah was unique. Hear me when I say this. Jeremiah was unique in that he saw horrible things and prophesied them even though it overwhelmed him. The psychology of most people is to do this. When they are exposed to things that are too much for them, they either go into a state of denial or they modify what they know and change it so it's not as bad. This happens to, if I may say, be so bold as to say, this happens to rape victims, sexual abuse victims. What do they do? How do they cope? Many times, it could be a combination of going into denial and modifying the narrative so that what they remember is changed, so they can handle it. If you see a bunch of people beheaded, that's going to be traumatizing to you, and most likely, you're going to go into a state of denial and you're going to modify what you saw. Jeremiah never pulled a punch. Despite the fact that, that the realities that God was speaking to him were so traumatizing that he could not handle it. Yes. 
He never backed off. He never cut. He never modified. He never went into a state of denial. In verse 19, at the beginning of our conversation, we hear Jeremiah speaking prophetically of the future exiles and what they would say. This is the exiles. They haven't been exiled yet. They haven't been conquered yet. But he's speaking in a conversation. And he's saying this is what they would say. Is the Lord not in Zion? Is there king no longer there? It's talking about God. It's talking about God. Jerusalem has been captured in this future reality, and the people have been exiled. But the exiles are shocked. Why would God, who dwells in Zion, which is Jerusalem, let his own city be overrun? Their perspective reflects a total lack of understanding of their sin. They act like God has abandoned them for no good reason. And why were the, weren't the exiles aware of their sin? Hmm. Because of the false prophets. During the time of Jeremiah, the false prophets were very successful and popular, and they dominated the religious world. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, Jeremiah was the only one among them that disagreed with them. He was the only true prophet. Now, Ezekiel was his contemporary, but Ezekiel, uh, when Ezekiel became a prophet, he became a prophet in Babylon where he had been exiled. But as far as Judah and Jerusalem is concerned, the only godly speaking person, the only true prophet, was Jeremiah. That's right. There were hundreds and hundreds of prophets and priests who spoke as false. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so sad. They prophesied over and over again prosperity and a general overall happiness for the people. They never warned the people about their sin and the coming consequence for it. You hear me when I say this? The defining characteristic of a false prophet is that they never warn. They never have anything but cheerleading and uplifting messages. Sure. Sure. They are always talking about how God wants to bless you. Mm -hmm. False prophets assume that they know better than God does about what people need to hear. They have a great desire to always be encouraging. They have an even greater desire to be popular. Sure. But scripture reflects the fact that the human soul needs to be challenged on a regular basis about its sin. That's right. There's a false prophet out there. He's probably the most famous of them all, and I'm going to keep his name out of this. But I remember him saying this. He says, I preach encouraging messages. People come in the church every week, and they're beat up from life. They just need to hear an encouraging message from God. Well, doesn't that sound right? That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? He's a full-blown false prophet. Why? Because he's not reflecting the truth of Scripture. God knows what the human soul needs. Yeah, it needs to be encouraged, but mostly it needs to have its rear end kicked. Amen. And God knows that. Amen. Remember this. The principle of Scripture is this. Encouragement only applies to the people that are carrying Christ's cross. It does not apply to people that are compromised, false, and full sin. That's right. <clears throat> the purpose of encouragement in Scripture is not to give someone just a feel-good message. False prophets falsely believe that they have the right dial in on the human soul and what the human spirit needs to hear on a regular basis and that is a lie the problem with it is that it tends to be very popular right. now the defining characteristic of a true prophet or minister is that they warn and they challenge and they talk about God's judgment book of Jeremiah, longest book in the Bible God's big pounding podium pounding emphasis it's not that they're always dark and melancholy, but it is that they follow the biblical pattern of correctly handling the Word of God. But back to our conversation. Jeremiah shows the people being shocked by their own destruction. And that is because they were lied to by the prophets and the priests. But it's also because they didn't love the truth. So you have a twofold problem, and this is exactly what we got going on in our world right now. You have people who really don't want to hear the truth. They just want a fantasy of encouragement. 
And so what they do is, is that they surround themselves, as Ezekiel said, they surround themselves with teachers who tell them what their itching ears are dying to hear. So it's a twofold problem. They don't want to hear the truth, and the false prophets are more than willing to accommodate that. In the last part of verse 19, we hear Jeremiah declaring what God would say. They come along and say, is there no God in Zion? Is there no, is there no king? And they're not talking about the physical king, they're talking about God the king. In Israel or in Judah to protect his people? And God comes back around and says at the end of verse 19, he says this, Why have they aroused my anger with their images, with their worthless foreign idols? God answers their question with another question. The people's lust for false prophecy and the lack of confronting their sin led them to believe that they could worship as many different idols as they chose to. They were never told about the warnings in the law of Moses about worshiping idols. But then again, they didn't want to hear that either. In so, so, so much of modern Christianity, this is the case. There is no desire to hear about sin and its judgment. But there are plenty of false ministers out there just itching to feed the longing for false doctrine. False ministers desire to be popular. Because when you're popular as a minister, you're also rich. I don't know if you all knew that, but it's... I'm not kidding. It's a huge temptation for ministers because they can put themselves in a position where they're making money and where they're making bank. And the public, in many cases, won't know anything about it. There's nothing wrong with making money. But if money is your God, there's a problem. I want you to understand something. In this verse, exile, which these Jews that... Jeremiah uses in this prophetic conversation about the future. They're in exile. That exile represents hell. If you and I don't want to be confronted with our sin, then we are on our way to hell. There has to be, if there has not been, let me say it this way, if there has been no genuine work of the Holy Spirit in you, you will not want to be confronted about your sin. Because you will not want to carry the cross of Christ. If there has been a genuine work of the Holy Spirit in you, then you will desire to take up your cross and follow Christ and let Him crucify you on a daily basis. Amen. If that is not your desire, you're not saved. How many people in this country right now, sitting in pews and churches across this country right now, are on their way to hell? There's a boatload, in my opinion. They have no desire to take up the cross and follow Christ. Christ repeatedly in the gospel says, take up your cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. Amen. Amen. Listen to what also Christ said in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Hear it. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. That comes from Christ himself. That's right. The life of the Christian is the way of the cross. If it's not the way of the cross, then you're not a Christian. Because there's been no genuine work of the Holy Spirit in you to give you that faith and that desire. It's easy to slip into an easy believism gospel. Don't do it. <clears throat> Verse 20. Verse 20 is the centerpiece of our text. Verse 20 is the centerpiece of the book of Jeremiah. And it is possible that verse 20 is the centerpiece of all 17 of the written prophets. But for sure, it's the centerpiece of the book of Jeremiah. In a very short three-line three -line poem, Jeremiah captures the essence of the problem facing the people of Judah. Hear it. The harvest is past. 
The summer has ended. And we are not saved. Yes. Jeremiah had seen one opportunity for revival after another come and go. The metaphor that Jeremiah, for, uh, Jeremiah is referring to is, is here is that, is that of harvests. Israel, Judah had a kind of a different harvest schedule than we do here, mostly. They would plant wheat and barley in the fall and then harvest them. And the barley would come up first in March, and that would coincide with the Feast of Passover. And then they would harvest the wheat in May, and that would coincide with Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost. And then they would harvest the fruit, which is the grapes and figs and blah, 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 blah. And that would coincide with the Feast of Tabernacles. And Jeremiah is using a powerful double metaphor. Harvests being associated with uh, the, the, the feasts. In other words, the harvest is associated with a spiritual function. The harvest is, is being associated with some, a spiritual need. And so Jeremiah is saying, the harvests are past. The summer has ended. And we are not saved. The opportunities have come. And they have gone. And there are no more. <clears throat> there were three distinct opportunities for Judah to turn back to God during the lifetime of Jeremiah. Or, yeah, and Josiah. The first one was when Josiah became king. He was a godly, passionate person. And they could have followed in behind his spiritual leadership and been lit on fire for God. The second opportunity came when Josiah's officials found a copy of the old law and read the whole thing to him. And Josiah was cut to the quick. He ripped up all of his royal robes and threw them on the ground. And then <laughs> he went on a rampage like nobody else. Josiah was so horrified at the fact that Judah was full of idols and he was going to do something about it. Josiah, with utter contempt, desecrated all the graves of the priests who had worshipped idols. Not only did he do that, but he went out and found the priests that were still worshipping at the temples and leading people to worship idols, and he killed them all, and then he desecrated their bodies. The evidence points to the fact, that this is the tip of the iceberg, you have to read 2 Kings 23, to, to, I'm not going to talk about the whole thing, I don't have time for that. But let me tell you something, Josiah, from one end to the other, from one end of the country to the other, and in every way you can possibly imagine, he got rid of idols. As a matter of fact, he took his army, and he went from house to house to house. They entered the house. If they found any household gods there, they destroyed them and ground them fine as dust. And who knows what he did to the people. He may have executed them. I don't know. doesn't say that. But I'm here to tell you, Josiah went on a campaign. Now, the people could have followed in behind that and said, hey, let's follow the king. But they didn't. The third and last opportunity that the, uh, the people of Judah were afforded was when Josiah was killed in battle by Pharaoh Necho. They should have recognized that the judgment that Jeremiah had been prophesying was, a, was coming down upon them suddenly because they were conquered by Egypt for three years. But they didn't. You know how they responded to Josiah's death? They went back and recarved all of their old idols, put their temples back up, reinstituted all the priests. That's what they did. Now, it's something that we very much need to take to heart. By my estimation, America has been given three opportunities for revival in the last 20 years. And all three of them have been resoundingly ignored. Two of them were to the general society in general, to the nation in general. And the third was specifically targeted at God's remnant here in America. The first one came on 9-11. The warning shot across the bow from God himself saying, hey, wake up, repent. Amen. Absolutely right. 
That warning shot should have caused God's people to double down on prayer for revival. It should have caused every God-fearing minister in America to confront their congregations with the truth of judgment. That the truth of the judgment that stands before us if we don't repent of our sin. But that never happened. Then in 2008, the stock market crashed because of the real estate market. And instead of the core, the remnant of God's people going all in for revival like the generation in the 1930s did, which I talked about before, they went towards politics instead. They decided, hey, we're going to solve this politically. Yeah. It should have inspired, greatly inspired God's remnant. The remnant, and we're talking a small minority, single digit percentage. It should have inspired them to weep and wail before the throne of, of God for the nation that it would come into revival. But that is not what happened. And then probably the most soul-stirring, turn my blood cold thing happened April 27th of 2011. And for some reason, nobody knows about this. Or nobody cares. Maybe that's a better way to say it. On April 27th of 2011, the Reverend David Wilkerson and his wife were driving down a highway in Texas. For inexplicable reasons, the Wilkerson's vehicle veered into the oncoming lane and hit a semi head on. It killed the Reverend David Wilkerson instantly, but his wife survived. David Wilkerson was this nation's greatest prophet. He was a man. He was a Jeremiah. It's exactly what he was. In every way. As a matter of fact, you could probably take all 17 of the prophets in the Old Testament, put them together, and that was the Reverend David Wilkerson. At the very same exact moment that that happened, and I don't know why this got past everybody, it seems. Starting right there in Texas, there was a tornado swarm that went across one-third of the United States from Texas to New York. 360 tornadoes killed 324 people and injured 3,011, causing $12.2 billion worth of damage. Right there. Same time. I liken the death of David Wilkerson to the death of Josiah for our nation. <clears throat> David Wilkerson was keeping the remnant of this country, its Christians, focused passionately on revival. As soon as he died, the core, the remnant of this nation of God's people went all in in politics and said, we're going to solve this politically. And that's where we have been ever since. That segue into politics, my friends, is a gross, gross, gross expression of horrible idolatry. Yeah. Because it's placing politics ahead of God. It's not that we can't have political expression. It's the fact that politics has to be driven by our religion, not the other way around. That's right. Amen. I've said it many times before. There will be no political solution until there is a spiritual solution, which is revival. Amen. Anybody who thinks that we currently are experiencing a political solution is blind as a bat. That's right. We are under the wrath of God like you wouldn't believe. God's remnant turned on him. Do you realize how unprecedented that is in the Christian history and in biblical history? Enter it. The question that goes through my mind every time I read this verse, verse 20, Lord, has the harvest passed? Lord, has the summer ended? Lord, have we lost our last opportunity for revival? 
Have we been turned over to our sin? And are we on a headlong dive towards judgment? As I said before, the death of the Reverend David Wilkerson is the same as the death of Josiah, as far as America is concerned. <clears throat> I said this before. Uh, what I pray for is a sovereign move of the Spirit of God in revival. What does that mean? It means that it's not associated with any judgment. It means that the so in sovereignty, God just comes down and convicts people, and it just becomes a wholesale flood of conviction. History is littered with both. Then there's the judgment type of revival, in which judgment hits, and then revival because of the judgment. In the remaining verses of our passage, we see Jeremiah grieving over the destruction of his people. And once again, this is prophetic. It hasn't happened yet. But he sees it. And he prophesies it. Do we see it? Do we grieve? Do we grieve over the sin of our society? Let me establish a biblical principle here. One cannot grieve over the sin of those around them unless they are in a regular habit of grieving over their own sin. And when I'm talking about that, I'm not talking about, oh, I messed up yesterday, I sinned yesterday, Lord, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, that's legit. But that's at the basic level. What I'm talking about is exposing yourself to God in your private prayer time to the point where the holiness of God starts to contrast with the sin that you are. Sure. Um, this is sin. You see this? This is all sin. Everything, head to toe. I'm nothing but sin. When you're in the presence of a holy God, you start to realize that you're nothing but sin. And that breaks you and causes you to be always a person of brokenness and repentance before God because you are nothing but sin. You and I cannot grieve over the sin of this society unless we are grieving over our own sin nature. And the only way that you can grieve over your own sin nature is if you're exposing yourself to the holiness of God. And the only way to expose yourself to the holiness of God is to spend large tracts of time in private prayer. Amen. There's another biblical principle that needs to be applied here. Hear me when I say this. And when I say this, I want you to understand something. I didn't say it. God did. And that is that anyone that doesn't grieve over the sin of those around them and their own sin will be destroyed under God's judgment. That's the way it works. Listen to Ezekiel 9, 3 through 6. And this is Ezekiel having a vision about what was happening in Jerusalem. Now the glory of, of, of the God of Israel went up from the cherubim where it had been and it moved to the threshold of the temple. Then the Lord called to the man in linen who had the writing kit at his side and said to him, Go throughout the city of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of all those who grieve and lament over the detestable things that are done in it. As I listened, he said to others, to the others, Follow him through the city and kill, showing without pity or compassion, no pity or compassion, slaughter old men, young men, maidens, women, and children. But do not touch, but do not touch anyone who has the mark. Begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were in front of the temple. The ones that God will spare in any coming judgment will be those who grieve over the sin of those around them. And the only way that they can grieve over the sin of those around them is if they're grieving over their own sin nature. When God pulls his hand of grace back and lets the hammer of judgment fall, only those that grieve over sin will be spared. Do we grieve? Do we weep over sin? Let me connect the dots again. One cannot grieve over the sins of those around them unless they grieve over their own sin. One cannot grieve over their own sin unless they're exposing themselves on a regular basis to the presence and the holiness of God. Verse 21 is the very essence of a true intercessor. Since my people are crushed, I am crushed. I mourn, and the horror grips me. 
A true intercessor not only grieves over the sin of society, they grieve over the judgment associated with it because they see it coming. They are crushed by the impending judgment, not on themselves, but on those who sin. Do they get incensed and angry? Oh, yes. There should be righteous indignation inside of us about the sin of our society. We should get angry, sure, absolutely. But mostly, they grieve. I'm going to share a story very quickly. A friend of mine over in Klamath, he's my best friend at Klamath Assembly. Great guy. He shared a story with me one time. He was in prayer and he felt very strongly. It was, he said, well, it, was, it was really the voice of the Lord, it was a vision. He says, I had this vision. He says, I saw the earth from space. And I saw, he says, I saw the hand of God. And God spoke to me and says, what should I do with it? What should I do to this planet? And he, he said to me, he says, I was shocked. Out of my mouth, spontaneously, without thinking about it, I said, smash it to smithereens. I'm not going to give you the rest of the story because it would take too long. Bottom line is that God confronted him and says, do you grieve over the sin and the sinners and the judgment? And what he discovered is that he didn't. He was angry. He was so angry. Hey, do you have a right? Yeah, 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 yeah. But let me tell you something. When you're confronted with your own sin nature by being in the presence of a holy God, it kind of takes that out. That's right. Yeah. You become just grieved, and you're broken, and you're crushed, and you mourn. Verse 22 is a very famous verse. <clears throat> it's been quoted many times for many different reasons, and you've probably heard it. It says this, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there no healing for the wound of my people? Now Gilead was right across the Jordan River from Judah, and it was a place well known for its medicinal plants. What Jeremiah is saying here is, yes, there is a balm in Gilead. Yes, there is a healing for my people. Yes, it's called repentance. <clears throat> If the people repented, God would forgive them and relent for bringing judgment. But they wouldn't repent because they were blind to their own sin. And they were blind to their own sin because they had purposely blinded themselves to their sin. And they were also blind because the false prophets told them everything that they wanted to hear. Have you and I blinded ourselves to our sin and to our sin nature? It's a very dangerous thing to do. Have we shut down any possibility of seeing it so that we can repent of it? And stay in an attitude of repentance. We move into chapter 9, verse 1. And this verse is even more awful. I have a hard time reading it. And it says this. Oh, that my head were a spring of water, and my eyes a fountain of tears. I would weep day and night for the slain of my people. This verse is almost too much to bear, because along with the rest of the passage, what it is saying is, hear me when I say this, because this is going to rock your world. Because this just does not get preached. It was too late. Did you know biblically that it can be too late? Yes. Did you know biblically that you can pray and pray and pray for somebody and cry and cry and cry for somebody and there and there comes a day when God says it's too late? Mm, yeah. Jeremiah comes face to face with the reality that it's too late. Listen to Luke 19, 41 through 44. This is Christ speaking. 
As he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it and says, If you, even you, had, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But it is now hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. That's right. Yes. We see Christ weep here. Why? Because Israel had lost its opportunity. The window had closed. The door was shut. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever wept and prayed for someone's soul only to discover a God saying it's too late? I have. Understand something. We need to be interceding for the lost. Because it takes a lot of warfare to bring them to Christ. Now I'll be positive here for a moment. Let me say something. Normally, most of the time, if we weep, and if we grieve, God answers. But there are some exceptions. Jeremiah had a profound and horrible exception. The Lord Jesus Christ had a profound and horrible exception. It is possible for us to lose the battle. <clears throat> but most of the time, God answers the tears. As Scripture says, the book of Psalms says this, Weeping may remain for a night, but joy comes in the morning. If you and I are grieving and weeping, God almost always says yes to that. The problem is, is that God's people are not weeping and they're not grieving. And then our last verse here this morning before we close. Verse 2 of chapter 9. Here you just see Jeremiah wanting to run away. And I don't blame him. He says, oh, that I had a had in the desert a lodging place for travelers so that I might leave my people and go away from them, for they are all adulterers and crowd of unfaithful people. You know what? Jeremiah never left. He never did. And tradition says that they stoned him to death. We don't know that, but that's what tradition says. We have a mission to complete. We need to understand what our role in this world and in this life is and how God looks at it. Not how we look at it, how God looks at it. Amen. And that is that we are called to facilitate people into repentance. Amen. Amen. Once again, I want to be positive here for a moment. If we are facilitators of our own brokenness and our own repentance, and that, let me tell you something, just say something, just say it right now. If that's who you are, that's who you become, that you start, that becomes your, your habit. Whenever you walk into a room, that spirit of brokenness and that spirit of repentance is going to go in front of you like a freight train. And it's going to be very powerful, and you're going to be walking in the power of God. That's what's going to happen. It's going to hit those people that are in front of you like a freight train, like a ton of bricks. Because you're walking in that spirit. Let me be positive again and say one other thing. If we recognize our mission and we understand what it is that God has for us in this world and this life, if we're concerned about what He's concerned about, which is lost souls, guess what? God tends to be really concerned and cares a great deal about what we're concerned about. Amen. And He tends to answer prayer. Thank you, Jesus. He just opens up the... Well, well, one of my grievers wants something. Woo! God tends to answer the prayers of the grievers and the weepers. 
and the people who facilitate repentance into the lives around you. This is a really simple concept. There's nothing complicated about it at all. We become broken and repent before God, and it will naturally have a powerful impact on the people around us. And we should always have that in our mind. Lord, let me be that facilitating force in people around me to bring them to Christ. To bring the conviction of the Holy Spirit to them. Now, I'm not talking about anybody in this church when I say this, but in general to the American church, I would say this. That isn't happening. It's true. There is almost no brokenness whatsoever. There's no recognition of our sin nature and, and, and exposed before holy God. And the Christians don't walk in repentance. Hear me when I say this. When you and I and this nation of Christians stand before God in the final judgment, God isn't going to be pointing at the sinners and their gross sin. No. He's going to be pointing at you and me. That's right. Because he's saying you stood in the way of their repentance. Understand something. There's a basic principle. I've said this before. I've said it quite a few times, as a matter of fact. The lost will not repent beyond our level of repentance. The lost will not be broken over their sin and the wrath of God beyond ours. That's the way it works. How broken are we? How repentant are we? Well, that's what they're doing. So they're a reflection of where our heart is. Are we broken? Are we repentant? Just go out and look and you'll find out. Because where we go and what we do and when we walk into a room, we're going to discover where the level of our brokenness and our repentance this may sound bragging, but this used to happen to me quite often at work. I would walk into a situation. Wow. These people get up on my grill for no reason. Why? Because they're being convicted. They didn't want to be convicted. But it needs to happen. I'll say it again. God has a mission for us. And that mission is to facilitate people into repentance. If you want to be one of those facilitators, stand to your feet. If you want to be one of those facilitators, stand to your feet. You want to be one of the people that God uses, that He just works through you, exposes His holiness to you. He says, hey. There's also, I've said this before. If you want to know what the peace of God that transcends all understanding is, how many really want to know that? Oh, right here now. Uh, I want to know the joy of the Lord to be my strength. I want it to flow through me like streams of living water. How many say that? Guess who that comes to? That comes to the griever and to the mourner. And to the one that has a constant goal of being broken before God and facilitating other souls into God's kingdom. All of the promises of Scripture are released like a flood to the person that grieves. That's right. We need to be people, and they're a great grief. But that grief also brings happiness, and it brings joy, That's and it brings peace. And here's the other thing. When people say, I want to know the love of God. Well, guess how you get to know the love of God? You grieve and you mourn. It comes at the, God starts to backfill your heart with every nuance and understanding of every aspect of His character. It becomes yours. You get ownership of it. Lord, I thank you for those that are gathered here today. I pray, Father, that you would bless them. Bless those that couldn't be here. Yes. Heal where there's needed healing, Father, and other things. Father, salvation, deliverance, whatever. Lord, I pray, Father, that, that, that uh, as people of God, that we will just start where we are and start spending time with you, and that we will ask you, Lord, to reveal your holiness so that we can understand our sin and sin nature. Yes, and that we would be facilitators of grief over sin in other people's lives. And that we would start to see that tidal wave move in front of us as we step through a doorway. I pray, Father, that we will start to see your power going out before us. That we will start to walk in your power. Because we're walking in your grief and in your mourning. Though that we will start to walk in the power that raises the dead, heals the sick, and casts out the demons. Yes, 
because we walk in your grief, because we carry your cross. I pray, Father, that none of us will experience that moment. None of us. Yes. Or for somebody we're praying for, it's too late. I pray that does not come near any of our experiences. But I do pray, Father, that it will motivate us to be people of prayer, people close to you, people of brokenness, and people of repentance. I pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.